Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rick Sammons, a member of the Managing Board of the Forum, and uh, I'm privileged to introduce this session on inclusive growth and development. Uh, inclusion is, it suffuses, if you will, the, the 2030 agenda. Very difficult uh, from a political perspective to, to move on reforms in, in almost any dimension, and left, unless there's a basic degree of public comfort that uh, the reforms are going to benefit society as a whole and that people will be brought along uh, together in the journey to try to improve the country's economy and uh, society more generally. Now, we at the forum, we found this to be one of the most hotly debated and uh, most in demand topics as we go around the world and talking uh, with our various communities in the summits like this. And so, with, in cooperation with some other international organizations uh, and other partners, we began a bit of a journey ourselves analytically uh, a couple of years ago uh, to think through, based on scholarship and uh, empirical experience, what might be a way to translate what the near universal aspiration for inclusive growth, because it really fundamentally has just been mainly that, into a, a concrete policy framework and a set of tools to help guide countries and their societies more down that path. And earlier this year, we issued uh, an inclusive growth and development report which sought to lay out uh, a framework for thinking more seriously about how one shifts the growth model of a country in this direction in a more structured and deliberate manner. I'm not going to give you the details of it. I'll suffice it to say that the conclusion is that institutional strength and the structural features of an economy uh, across a variety of dimensions, we identified 15 of them, are really the key to getting the win-win between <coughs> dynamism and growth on the one hand and inclusion or broad-based progress and living standards as we call it on the other. And that uh, policy maker, economic policy makers for the last generation have been very focused on the efficiency opportunities in economies. Understandably, coming out of the 1970s where there was a big concern about stagflation, particularly in the West, and sclerotic markets. But in the process, we have underemphasized during that period a, a spectrum of institutional features and structural features of economies which as a whole act as an ecosystem for recycling and for broadening the diffusion of the benefits of growth throughout society. That, that set of 15 institutional areas really is the income distribution system writ large in an economy. And the point of the report was to say, number one, here is data, we amassed a a comprehensive cross-country database in these 15 areas and said, countries, you can take a look at how you are relatively weak or strong, how much of your policy space relative to the experience of your peers you are or are not using in each one of these 15 areas of structural institutional strength. So that's a tool. But secondly, we drew a larger conclusion for the larger economic policy debates post-financial crisis to say, everyone has talked about rebalancing economic policy. And, and growth models. Well, the rebalancing is to assign an equal priority to these kinds of institutional features across certainly education systems, infrastructure, the way uh, uh, rents, the way the financial system does or does not intermediate capital to real economy investments. You'll see in the, in the material uh, the, the different areas. By assigning an equal weight to that those structural elements with that uh, ascribed to financial stability or macroeconomic management, which are still very, very important, we can rebalance and find a better confluence between dynamism <coughs> and growth and efficiency on the one hand and broad-based progress and living standards on the other. Now, you may ask, why am I intervening on this in a summit that is dedicated not so much to public policy or economic policy, but rather to multi-stakeholder partnership in advancing the sustainable development goals? The reason is this, is that yes, there needs to be, and there is already uh, percolating quite an internal debate within the economics uh, uh, 
academic community on the one hand and policymakers on the other. And that needs to take place. It doesn't necessarily have such a multi-stakeholder flavor to it. The reality is in order to shift the growth model, this, the economic policy priorities of a country, what is needed is a constituency for that. And often we have found in our travels that two things can help very much in that regard. When there's an intentionality, and we see that, leaders want to move toward inclusive growth, what can be very helpful in that respect are, is data, and that's why we put out the benchmarking data in this regard. But secondly, a, a, a set of stakeholders who are prepared to engage with the policymakers at a very senior level, at a leader level, across business, across academia, civil society groups, labor unions, and the rest, mm -hmm. to talk together about the strategy of the country in this regard. And that kind of a strategic multi-stakeholder conversation some kinds can improve the political economy, can improve the political climate for governments to be able to take reforms in such a direction and be able to explain it as being a win-win in the way that, that I've just described. So we, uh, the OECD, the ILO, uh, and the World Bank have been in discussion about taking our various analyses and tools and combining to facilitate <coughs> a multi-stakeholder, a public-private series, a dialogue, if you want to call it that, of strategy discussions about inclusive growth, actionable pathways for inclusive growth in countries that have an interest in having such a multi-stakeholder uh, conversation. and. Uh, we, uh, in addition to that, we in the World Bank uh, will soon be launching a platform that, prov that rolls up best practice both on the policy side but also on the corporate side for what can be done with the support of IDRC of Canada and also the German uh, Development Ministry. And so I just wanted to set that institutional context for this discussion and, and hand it over to Gillian Tett, who is uh, leader here of reporting for the Financial Times of the United States. We are very privileged to have you uh, moderate this session. She, if, if you don't remember, really had the, the most sterling reporting during the heat of the financial crisis, that, at least as far as I'm concerned. And she brings, if I can say this, a bit of an anthropological approach to her reporting on economic and financial issues. And if there's one issue that requires uh, some anthropological uh, examination and support, uh, it's certainly this one because it is so multidisciplinary. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed, and I'm very honored to be here today looking at this issue. And it's a very striking sign of the times, the fact that we're sitting here talking about inclusive growth and development, or if you like, to be more frank, we're talking about inequality and what to do about that. Because you only have to go back sort of four, five, six, seven years and the issue of inequality really wasn't top and center of the debates at places like Davos, um, even the UN. Now it's absolutely central to so much of the, the discussion because there is such a clear recognition that we live in the best of times and the worst of times. We're seeing economic growth, which actually has been relatively steady in recent years. We're seeing stunning technological miracles unfolding almost daily. And yet we're also seeing signs of rising social tensions and income inequality inside many countries. And as of yet, no one's actually worked out how to have good, fast, healthy growth that is equally spread and which doesn't create social tensions. So it's a great time to be an anthropologist. It's a great time to be a journalist. And it's a great time to have these diverse perspectives on the panel. Um, essentially, what we have are two... Um, people who are actually involved in trying to fix inequality or deal with some of the challenges um, in relation to it. We have Minister Anusha Rahman Khan, who's Minister of State for Information and Technology and Telecommunications in Pakistan, who can tell us how they're using digital technology to try and deal with it. She has some very interesting statistics to share. We have Luis Fernando Maya Alzate, who's the Minister of National Planning of Colombia, um, I was just told that Colombia is the class SWAT, the star pupil of the SDGs, apparently. Apparently, it's been scurrying around ahead of almost anybody else to prepare for this. So he can tell us, as class SWAT, what they're doing and how that's going to address inequality. We have John MacArthur, senior fellow at Brookings Institute, who is 
um, taking a masterful overview of the issues. And Sharon Burrow, woman known to many of you, who's the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, who can talk to us from the labor perspective about what needs to be done. Um, but I thought I'd start perhaps with John to, I know you've been working at Brookings looking at these issues recently. Um, how do you interpret the current challenge and the fact that people are focusing on it so much? Well, first, thank you. And uh, I hesitate to take on a masterful overview next to the masterful overviewer uh, of these issues. But I think it's exactly as you said. I remember very clearly when the debates over the Sustainable Development Goals got going, you know, five, six years ago. And some people were saying, we need to include a centerpiece issue on inequality. And I said, oh, that's sticky territory. <laughs> you know, will that, and it ended up being the through line that everyone agreed on needed to be there at every stage. And that's part of the big change in, I would say, geopolitics in the past several years is this uh, shift from not just tackling extreme poverty issues that were in the Millennium Development Goals, but really inclusive prosperity. But when we think about, just to think of a big, big picture of what's going on, I think the Sustainable Development Goals boil down to three basic issues that every country is trying to take on. Uh, I call it uh, recoupling, decoupling, and then no one left behind. The recoupling is this notion of recoupling economic progress with social progress. When I went to graduate school, it was uh, always uh, a given, roughly speaking, that as long as your economy was doing well, you know, the social indicators would get better over time. Roughly speaking, most people don't believe that anymore. Uh, so the economy is growing, what does that mean for me? And this notion of uh, the economy doing better, meaning my family is doing better, is a, a premise that needs to be reignited, I would say, at the most basic level. The second is the decoupling. That's the decoupling, the economic progress from the environmental strain. So roughly speaking, each new unit of economic progress is cranking out one corresponding unit of an environmental problem. And we haven't figured out how to disconnect those two variables yet. That's climate, that's oceans, that's forest, biodiversity, water, what have you, air. But the third is, and I think this is where I'd really focus too, it's the no one left behind. And this notion, and I would argue that this is uh, manifest in every society in the world right now, you know, what does it mean to have a, both an economic and social contract where people don't get left behind? That's marginalized groups, that's uh, based on sexuality in some countries, that's based on ethnicity in some places, that's based on class, that's based on geography. And what we see if we kind of drill down beneath these, there are some very practical issues because each of those three issues looks different in different parts of the world. The first, I think, if I were to outline things that maybe we haven't been paying enough attention to at a practical level, for the extremely poor people around the world, it's still the agriculture issue. This is the engine of the economy. Farming is business. Uh, the infrastructure to get your goods to market. This disconnection in its deepest form. But the other is, if you're in the job market, it's the skills agenda. It's the urban planning agenda. It's the where do I live? How does my life physically connect to the economy and society? And we're in the peak moment of people moving into cities in history, and we have to make sure those cities work for people. But the other, and I'll just finish with this for now, is no one left behind is a little bit different than uh, in my home country, Canada, we talk about uh, inclusive prosperity for the middle class. It's not quite the same thing, actually. Mm. And I've recently even been looking at uh, the sustainable development goal indicators within Canada. And one of the things it shows you is on issue after issue after issue, there's a significant amount of the population just getting left behind whether it's indigenous communities, on health, even access to drinking water, whether it's uh, basic skills, literacy and numeracy for functioning in an automated economy. Uh, we see on each of these issues that there's maybe 10, 15% of the population in so many societies just getting left behind. And this is where we come to questions around what does social protection look like? Uh, do we need basic income? Do we have to think differently about pensions? Do we have to think in a new way, especially for the fast-growing economies that are going to be putting a couple billion more people into the global middle class soon, how to not just think through how to make sure no one gets left behind, but how to make sure there's protection for once they get there. And that's how I would really boil down what I see as the, the core issue today. Right, right. 
Well, how does that play out in a country like Pakistan? I mean, how do you see the challenges? Thank you very much for having me here this afternoon. It's, uh, uh, this debate is going on, and, and yesterday also we, we heard a few panelists, and uh, it was uh, quite an alarming, actually, observation made by one of the panelists yesterday that 50 people in this world hold the wealth which is more than 3.5 3 billion people hold here. So this fact tells us about a lot about the inequality and the survey uh, that has recently been done makes us all think that if this is the outcome of whatever has been done in the last 50 years, do we want the next 50 years to continue like that? Or are we actually going to stand up and instead of saying, you do this, you do that, we start saying we all together come forward and do something about our children. So I think there is this complete need of thinking and rethinking the way we've always thought. And this rethinking puts us into some conclusions, at least that I've made as a minister in the last four years there in Pakistan. That first of all, if you're talking about growth and you're talking about inequality, we have to target educating more girls and women. We have to start thinking about means and ways of bringing them into the mainstream, decision making, policy making, and getting them educated. Obviously, that's the first. And then when we, once we have done that, uh, we would have automatically got a huge workforce ready to start contributing towards the economy as a whole. And primarily, once the economy as a whole is handled, the, the deprivation, and as you said, whether whatever is happening is helping me at home, is improving my life, and so on, I think we all need to work together to think collectively that whatever we have put in in the SDGs is something that we all achieve together as well. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we will have the same outcome as we have with MDGs. So as, as we speak um, in the last four years in Pakistan, I um, and looking at the World Bank report saying that every 10% broadband penetration gives up to 1.38% growth, I decided to start uh, implementing that, th that facet. So we um, targeted the USF funding and we invested something like $400 million in the last three years in infrastructure, putting technology infrastructure to the underserved, unserved areas. And, and I can claim that, that I have given out from the USF board today all the contracts, which will then, in the rollout of coming, uh, completing in, by December 2018, we will have every one village which has 100 population and which is not connected will be connected. So we have an infrastructure then the e-highway, as I call it, complete by the end of 2018. So once we've done the supply side, I mean, is the optic fiber cable there, the technology there going to improve the lives of people? I'm sorry, the answer is no. Just putting out the infrastructure is not the answer. How we use the technology is what is required very much. Technology itself does nothing. The use of technology, the, how we use the technology for, for education, how we use the technology for health, how we use the technology for security, how we use the technology for all the M's and the E's is now the critical part of the technology which the next 3.5 odd billion who need to get connected. And the challenge is that the next 3.5 or 4 billion people who are not connected are the ones who are the blackguards. They're not connected because they didn't want to get connected. They're not connected because they're probably not literate enough. Probably they're not, they can't afford it simply. Probably they don't even know. They're ignorant about the technology altogether. So we will have to work, all of us will have to work to ensure that those people who are getting the technology, the optic fiber cable, they also know how to use it, how to use it to be economically vibrant, sufficient for them for the socioeconomic growth. And once this all is happening, without literacy, without the digi skills, everything that I'm speaking about, those 400 and 
40 odd million dollars are zero if it doesn't get translated into the demand side. So the, for the demand side, the, the next realm has to be put in, which is app development, startups, incubation, technology parks, but most importantly, the digi skills. Right. You have to teach them how to be digitally literate. So I've started a program, it's called a digi skills program, training one million youngsters to become freelancers, to know how to use technology. Pakistan is ranked number four in freelancing. And I want to take it up to number one. Right. I have tough competition. I'm training girls in ICTs, and I've started a program called ICT for Girls. And starting 31st of October, one million, uh, uh, sorry, 110,000 girls will be starting off on coding. Mm -hmm. So starting from age year four till 15, I'm expecting 110,000 girls every year to be trained in coding just in Islamabad public sector schools. But then we will scale it up to the rest of the country. Although I do get a demand from the boys public sector schools that Madam Minister is very biased towards the girls, but I think that just by starting this initiative, actually the schools are now pushed towards putting the same training program which I'm doing with Microsoft for the boys as well. Right. There's one more thing which is very important for this inclusive growth and development. And I would like to re-emphasize it, that the governments can't do everything alone. You will need to have the private sector, the thought leaders, um, the youth, the old, everybody who has done the cycle, those who are coming on the cycle, the NGOs and all of us, to work together to attain this very ambition of achieving SDGs by 2030. What was missed out when we were drafting the SDGs was adding um, adding ICT, information communication technology, as the 18th goal. Because in order to be the enabler, in order to achieve those goals, you need those infrastructures to be in place so that you can achieve your rest of the 17 goals with the speed. But this got missed out. Um, but even though it was, but I think there's a realization uh, at all levels, whether it's WEF, whether it's ITU, uh, whether it's at the UN, if the Broadband Commission, that we have missed it out, but we can, because it, it's a very cost-intensive in infrastructure. Right. This cost-intensive infrastructure is not going to come from the private sector alone. Right. So what the private sector is doing is making a contribution in the form of the USF. And I'm emphasizing on every platform that the government should stop using that funding to cover their, their budget deficit. The governments have to start spending that money, which is coming from the private sector, right. on the telecom infrastructure itself. Okay. Because I think, in my country, I've noticed in the last two, three years, that the growth that we have achieved, I do take a percentage of that to the infrastructure that we have right. laid. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Those are absolutely fascinating. So in a nutshell, what you're saying is that you need to build the infrastructure you need to teach people how to use a digital infrastructure as one potential step or path to go down, and then to work with the private sector, essentially, get them to pay for a fair amount of it, and make sure that it actually has an inclusive model. They're already so, paying for it. What I'm good. saying is that the government should start using that money right. for the purpose for which it was paid in the beginning. Right. Well, I must say, I'm, I'm very touched by your story because um, many, many years ago, I worked, spent a year of my life working in Pakistan in a hospital, and I learned to read and write Urdu with a group of the very lowly women in the hospital. And we had to sort of basically hide in one of the laundry cupboards to do it together, um, almost in secret, because they were worried about other people knowing that they were learning to read and write. So I often think that one, teaching women who are kept trapped inside how to read and write is such a revolutionary thing. Giving them an iPhone is extraordinary in terms of the potential. But then the question is, how do you overcome the cultural obstacles and the inevitable resistance that that involves? I mean, that's your problem. But no, <laughs> no, but I would just want to interject here for one second that this my ICT for Girls program has started rolling in the far-flung areas. The most remotest parts of the country, I'm getting maximum membership for this program, and the parents are letting them come. Great. So things are changing. Well, that's incredibly exciting. But mm -hmm. um, how about Colombia? Mm. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as you mentioned, Colombia had a very definite role in terms of formulating the SDGs. 
Uh, we worked on that before the Rio conference in 2012. Uh, we had the idea of moving towards a more comprehensive set of goals, not only goals developed and focused on growing economies and on emerging economies. The things about, for example, inclusive growth, about um, gender equality, are things that are not only affect developing economies, are also developed economies. So we wanted to set up an agenda that at first was met with very high skepticism, why Colombia was doing this. But then afterward, uh, I think uh, it was very successful, and now there's a, well, we, we already know that the SDGs. So Colombia moved forward uh, starting from 2014 once the SDGs were already set up and incorporating most of the objectives in the National Development Plan is kind of the roadmap for the new government. What are the main policies that are gonna be attacking the objectives, uh, how to set up those goals, what are the private and public actors involved in attaining those goals. And we also have a monitoring scheme which is very important. The private sector wants to get involved with the uh, completion of these objectives, but then it wants to, of course, have a good say in the monitoring, how the projects are evolving, what the financing involved. So it's important to have, to have the monitoring as well. Now, in terms of inclusive growth, so the Colombian government has been working, I'd say, in two main dimensions. First, peace process. The peace process is one of the few good news that the world economy has uh, this year. We completed the peace process on, on last year. The, the guns were handed out by the guerrilla, by the guerrilla movement, the FARC, uh, a couple of months ago, that's going to have not only an economic dividend, but also an environmental dividend. Uh, the guerrilla used to, for example, had some, um, um, you know, plant some bombs with oil pipelines that spill the water sources, and that had an enormous uh, environmental impact, and that's going to end with the peace process. Now, the other part, of course, more micro-focused uh, is especially education. Education in terms of tertiary education, professional education in Colombia has been very uh, backward. The access has been very low. We managed to increase the access from 32% of total population to 51% in five years. So that's very important, unlocking the productivity of human capital, that's key. And also helps with, with the thing that you were mentioning before, Minister, the appropriation of technology. If you have the infrastructure, if you have access to broadband, but you don't know how to use it, uh, well, we're not gonna be unlocking productivity. And that, finally, I tie that to the other agenda, which is the fact that Colombia, even though uh, has, has had, well, this civil conflict for more, more, more than 50 years, has had a remarkable macroeconomic stability. It's probably one of the few Latin American economies that didn't have a default on its public debt uh, since the 1930s. We have never had a uh, hyperinflation. Uh, so it's a very remarkable, stable economy. We have grown about around 4% for the past 20 years on average. Now, where are the sources of growth coming from? Essentially two, investment, where we now have an investment rate which is close to 30% of GDP, the highest in Latin America, and also the increased labor supply. So the demographic changes have uh, increased labor supply and the unemployment rate has come down for the past 15 years. Now those two sources of growth are probably coming to an end. What's left is productivity growth, where Colombia has had uh, tremendous problems in increasing productivity growth. Now the agenda of education, of technology appropriation, and of course one important impact, which is regulation, better regulation, is gonna have, I think, we think an important impact in the medium term of increasing productivity growth, which is the one that we feel is gonna have an impact on uh, inclusive growth. And does better regulation mean deregulation? Not at all. That's, uh, that's uh, not the way that's we, certainly, we're That's for. what, you know, better regulation in America these days gets translated yeah. to deregulation. So. Well, what we mean by better regulation is better regulation. It's making sure that uh, the, the benefit of regulation exceeds its cost to the private sector. Of course, there are things that we need to regulate. Regu regulation is important, especially for uh, environmental issues. But uh, sometimes the uh, process of regulation doesn't uh, consider the alternatives or the intended, unintended consequences of regulation. Just to mention a, a number, we did an inventory of regulation that was issued uh, for the 21st century in Colombia, and that there were 2.7 decrees per day signed by the president for the past 17 years. 
So the, this is probably a problem of inflation of regulation. The quality probably is not going to be that high. So we have, we're setting up a program uh, where we are doing a widespread review of the process to guarantee the quality of regulation, which is important for, for the productivity growth. Yeah. Right, right. Well, that's in terms, of, we've heard about how to make economies more um, productive um, and how to try and spread some of the benefits through gender focus, tech focus. Um, how does, what, what's your perspective on this, Sharon? Well, I think the opening comment, recoupling social progress and decoupling natural resources, I mean, that's the central challenge. And if you think that our current global model is simply inequality by design, then we've got the power to change it if we really want to. When you think that 80% of the profits of global trade are captured by 10%, just 10% of publicly listed companies, and that that's based on a model of profit where 94% of those global corporations, 94% of the workforce of those global corporations are actually a hidden workforce. Corporations today barely employ 6% directly. Now, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, working with partners, contracting to uh, SMEs, etc. But if you don't know and take responsibility for decent work, a world where there is, in fact, uh, labour market institutions, human rights, the right to bargain collectively for a fair share of the profits or the resource productivity, if we're serious about decoupling, or even pay a minimum wage with a secure contract of work and, uh, and a safe work, then what you're doing is saying anything goes. And we've got a global workforce now in trouble because anything goes. When you've got 60% only of the workforce on some kind of formal employment, and then um, contract of employment, and then more than half of those are in insecure, pre precarious, often unsafe work with, in fact, low wages, primarily. And when I talk about low wages, I can tell you what it would take to pay a living wage in Asia. In the poorest of countries, which are the dominant supply chain hubs, about 50 US dollars a month. Now, you add that up, 50 US dollars a month, times 12, do the maths, around 600, some of those companies make up to $17,000 profit from every supply chain worker, not just their direct employee, but some will tell you they have three or 400,000 employees, they actually have things like 1.2, 6 million. And so when you're taking that kind of profit from every worker and you won't pay them a minimum living wage, something's very, very wrong. And so why are markets shrinking? Why are people worried about growth declining? Well, that's pretty obvious, really. Then you've got 40% of our workforce that's just in the sector of desperation. They're informal workers, there's no regulation, no minimum living wages, no social protection, indeed no rule of law. In fact, 75% of workers in the global economy, that means their families as well, have little or no social protection. And yet, you know what that would cost? Again, in the poorest of countries, less than 6% of GDP. We could fund it from illicit flows and tax evasion, that would be a good start. And if you put that level of social protection as a floor with uh, care and, and pensions and unemployment support, health, education, and then you add to that a minimum living wage, then that's a competitive floor. The one thing that the G20 countries acknowledged this year, got little press, but the Labor ministers said to the, the leaders who supported their communique, you have to take oppression out of competition. You have to take violations of labour rights out of competition, something Rick and others have promoted for a very long time. So if we're serious about a global economy, that's where we have to head, and it's not a hard recipe. In fact, I would say to you on the, on the recipe side, just think about this. It's a social protection floor. It's a minimum living wage. It's the right to bargain for uh, direct productivity from labour or resource productivity where we get down emissions so that you save companies money either on carbon trading or indeed or carbon, uh, carbon price or indeed on the cost of, uh, of energy and so on. And I want to finish by saying, you know, digitalisation's a really significant piece, but it's creating so many myths that it just drives me crazy. You know, it's the tram tracks of the future, um, or in fact today, and increasingly the future. It's nothing more than that. 
It's the enabling business environment, the enabling communications environment for social and business activity. But work is work. If I'm working for you directly, or I'm working for an agency that employs me to work for you, or indeed I'm working for many of you on, by contracting on the internet, I still need the same things as that simple recipe. It might take a change to competition policy, but if I can form cooperatives or I can form freelance unions, and indeed I can bargain for a contract price, the entertainment industry in this country has done it forever, then you set a floor of what we call a minimum living wage, but by any name. So we've got the solutions. We really do have the solutions. It's really about whether we've got the, the will and the morality to care for each other so we share prosperity. If you think, final word, that the world is richer by three times in terms of GDP, and yet our people are in trouble, employment is a huge fear for people, then what's wrong with us? We know investing in that architecture will drive jobs. Investing in the green economy will drive jobs. We know that care at the centre of who we are as human beings will drive even more jobs. You invest in childcare, aged care, health and education, you get a triple jobs dividend. You get jobs for women, about 75% of jobs will go to women and we need women in the, in the global economy to actually drive productivity. It'll free women to work in other areas of the economy. And guess what, guys? You get a 4% male dividend in jobs as well because of infrastructure and services. So all the facts are there. But if we don't recouple the commitment to some regulation around uh, labour market institutions and, and uh, protections, if we don't care enough about the workers who drive our economy and we don't afford them their rights with some social protection, and a decent living wage, then you've got to ask who we are as human beings and do we want to really deal with inequality? Well, that's a very rousing call to arms and a very powerful set of numbers. Um, I'm curious, you know, when you listen to all the companies, all the CEOs who are, you know, around at the UN meeting this week, do you see any sign that any of them get it? Because there's been a lot of, you know, commitment to the SDGs, a lot of, I've been very struck by how many business leaders are here this week. Is that just, you know, cosmetic window dressing, whitewash in your view? No, there is a core group. There's not enough, but there's a core group. I'm a leader of the B team. You know, if you'd have ever said that the trade union number one troublemaker in the world would actually be joining forces with Paul Polman and Bob Collymore and a whole range of other CEOs to say our world has to shift that probably wouldn't have been able to be discussed five years ago, let alone 10 years ago. The, uh, the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, one of the recommendations is a new social contract. And again, I was part of that discussion. So yesterday, uh, Stefan Löfven, the Prime Minister of Sweden, a miracle economy, by the way, in the current world, growth at 4.3%, I think, certainly around four, unemployment uh, going right down the, the right way, integrated 300,000 refugees, and indeed has a, a surplus in, uh, in budgetary terms, it doesn't get much better than that. But what's he saying? That in fact, we need social dialogue. That unless there's a global deal around talking to each other and finding the solutions. And if you'd been at the um, Concordia Summit this morning, which I had the privilege to, uh, to in fact uh, moderate, I must say, I didn't have to put out the demands. The CEOs and the government people there were putting them out and I was just reiterating them. And Paul Polman's call to, call to arms was, voice your values, make no compromises, and indeed we all said in the end and support each other because if we don't put the call out there and we don't design the economic and social uh, base of our uh, economies, then who do we blame? Ourselves. Right. Well, that seems like a good moment to put it put in the audience, um, since I know there are many people in the room who have a lot of expertise and have been very involved in this issue. I think it'd be great to see if anyone wants to make any comments or ask any questions. Um, I can see a hand up going up already. Um, it would, as ever, be courteous but not compulsory to identify yourself, um, and I'd say let's try and keep the comments or questions, you know, relatively short, so we can get as many of them as we can as possible. Yeah. 
thought I'd uh, pitch in right in because it's an interesting segue with uh, Madam Burrow's work. Uh, so, in India, we have uh, the, one of the world's largest dairy cooperatives, four billion dollars in revenue, Amul, owned by farmers. Mm. Eighty-four percent of four billion dollars goes straight down to the farmers. Mm. So, I mean, I'd, we are in the process of uh, trying to build out an ecosystem for farm and off-farm. Uh, women. Uh, so it's, it's just an interesting uh, to see uh, what you just said. And uh, there is all this talk about financial inclusion, creating safety nets for women. But unless you are giving women real jobs in real value chains, and we have the millennial fashion customers who are going to want to buy sustainable fashion 10 years from now, 20 years now, there's a lot of reinvention we need to do, basically. So that is just my comment. Right. Well, thank you. That's a very good point, particularly given the discussion about using technology to unlock the economic potential of girls. Um, Can I just respond to that? Because I've just nominated a woman from India who builds cooperatives like the ones you're talking about, uh, a woman from Siwa, to the ILO's Future of Work Commission, along with Phil Jennings, who I think is in the back of the room, who many of you know is one of our uh, thinkers on these questions. And the reason I want Rima in the room is because she builds cooperatives in the real world. They're working with us to try and formalise the childcare sector. And of course, a lot of care is now being deli delivered on global platforms with no regulatory support at all for public safety or for the worker. And indeed, you know, we know that you can take that technology that's age old for us and build cooperatives on the internet. So we're trying to marry the modern services union that Phil runs with, of course, the technology and the need to formalise work in terms of the women's area. And India has a lot to teach us, I think, along with Pakistan and others. So I think that's a brilliant perspective. Right. We have a comment back there. Hi, I'm Brian Gallagher. I'm the CEO of United Way. Um, I wonder if, uh, Sharon, you were talking about jobs, but for the whole panel, um, you know, there's this concentration of wealth in today's global economy, and there's got to be a way to share the wealth. Um, even though the, you know, digital, you know, the digitalization of the economy may be the tracks for the, for the new economy, automation seems to be creating productivity and profit that doesn't require the same amount of labor. And I wonder if jobs and a focus on jobs, or is it a focus on livelihoods that actually get us to a different place. And I wonder if that framework around, around jobs is, is um, while important, and you know, I, you know I think it's important, is it, is it almost diminishing in that, is it jobs and livelihood, is it something broader in, in terms of that redistribution? And the other thing I'd love to hear comments on is the future of cities. Um, you know, what is the role of the city as more and more people live in urban areas around sustainability and livability and, and so forth, at least in the U.S., where, where you see this playing out is at the city level, not even at the state or provincial level, but the city level. Who would like to jump in on that? Now, I would just comment on one thing, that uh, in this world of disruptive technologies that we are entering now, or we have already entered, there is going to be a huge issue with jobs in terms per se, jobs, the traditional jobs that we have known. Because artificial intelligence would not require any lawyers because the, the computer all figured in is going to be responding and that's to what thing. legal advice you need. You wouldn't be needing any doctors per se because artificial intelligence will tell, will tell you that what is your disease, what the diagnosis, what potential diseases can you have in the future, and so on and so forth, in addition to treating you. So I, the way the world is moving, and that's why I was saying that we all have to sit down and rethink the next 20 years, because this time is coming very, very fast. No governments can predict what technology does to them. Once they are hit, they start thinking, it's already too late. So what the World Economic Forum should be thinking about what the next 20 years is bringing to this world. And what, it bring, what it's bringing to the world is an era of disruptive technologies. Netflix has more movies on its repository without owning a single cinema. 
Uber has got the largest taxi resource without owning a single taxi. And you have examples and after examples when I discuss disruptive technologies. So which country in the world or which forum in the world is talking about the scenarios that are going to emerge in the next 10 years where we will have to rethink what education is, when we will have to rethink who is going to serve us, the computers, the robots, because we spoke about robots 30 years ago, but this is the first time in the history of human era that we are actually talking about having, going to see elimination of the real jobs from the hands of the humans into the hands of the machine. Well, can I just say the oh, WEF yeah. is doing really valuable work. The Future of Production uh, Agenda Council has all the partners in the room, in a sense. It has uh, the ministers, some are trade ministers, some are other ministers. I think about 28, Rick, I've lost count, but Helena could tell us. Um, it has the tech folk, it has civil society, has a few renegades like us, and it has some academic thinkers. I mean, Subra Suresh, who co-chairs this with me, is one of, I think, the deepest thinkers. And he points out that we've made a lot of mistakes, that some of the best innovations of the last century ha actually have caused some of the biggest global threats, one of them being nuclear. But, uh, and right now, that's pretty topical, given the address at the UN this morning by the US president. But when you actually think about this, I'm, I'm not a doomsayer about this. I think technology is technology. And, you know, people, our global sh uh, surveys show us that it's not about the, the technology that people are frightened. It is about the jobs, and that's where you're absolutely right. But, again, I say work is work. We're not prepared to give up on the dignity of work, and there's plenty of work in our communities, there'll be work in our businesses. We just have to value work differently. So the work that is about each other is, out, is about care, it shouldn't be undervalued while we value engineering or artificial intelligence uh, construction more. So how do we actually do what you're saying, focus on livelihoods and the dignity of work? And, uh, and, and we've seen technological kind of, you know, doomsayers before. I remember being told as a, as a um, well, I was a teacher in the 70s, actually, and I was taken out of schools as a very young teacher, I might add, to write curriculum for leisure in my own country, Australia, because everybody was going to have all this leisure time. It was great curriculum. It's at the bottom of a big black hole because it didn't happen. But then in the 90s, I was a union leader, and, uh, and we were told that all those dirty industries, the, you know, blue-collar sectors, they were going to go, and there was all these knowledge industries, and... You know, everyone had to be, uh, you know, so highly educated that it was going to be a disaster for the economy if they weren't. Well, we did reskill, but I tell you what, we said and we were right. You will just graft technology onto existing businesses, and we'll still have manufacturing and construction and services and agriculture. You know, not just today, but tomorrow. And so that's why I say, you know, let's figure out some of the moral questions about technology, that's a societal debate. But really, if we look at how you create jobs and it gives us a chance to use the wealth that comes from some of that technology to create jobs that are about recoupling the issue of social progress. So I'm, I'm not pessimistic about reshaping jobs. We've seen that many, many times. It's the same thing we say about this transition as we say about the green transition, it's got to be just, and that means it has to focus on people. Right. Good. Okay. Well, I know that um, Enrique Borone wants to say something or add to the contribution, make a contribution. Thank you. I'm Federico Borone. I'm a member of... Uh, that's okay. I'm a member of IDRC, Canada's IDRC, the International Development Research Centre. In fact, I would like to, first of all, I mean, uh, pose a question to the, to the whole panel. Uh, one of the reasons why IDRC is partnering with the World Economic Forum is uh, essentially to better understand how research, which is the subject, which is the type of uh, work we do, we support research for development, research, the production of uh, knowledge that could uh, perhaps uh, shorten the way of uh, reaching solutions, reaching some of the innovations that we are hearing in this panel. 
And as I said, we partnered with the World Economic Forum in order to understand how we can create connections between the academic world, the world of the researchers, with the private sector. What are the real challenges engaging research with the private sector? If the private sector is serious about contributing, participating, collaborating with the framework, sustainable development goals, and much more specifically with inclusive growth. So one of the questions would be for members of the panel, uh, representing the different institutions, representing your different uh, contributions to this particular topic, not only what, I think that we discuss enough in terms of what could be the agenda, what could be the key topics, but on the how. How do you think research centers could connect with the private sector and by doing that could improve the relationship between your institutions, governments, and others with perhaps a much more collaborative framework and approach moving forward? Well, maybe that's something that John should talk to you and then also Minister from Colombia. Uh, full disclosure, I also happen to be on the board of IDRC, but I'm not involved with this project, but uh, I think it differs by country. There's a whole movie called Inside Jobs saying there's too much collaboration <laughs> between the academics and the private sector, right? And so I think I'm a big fan of problem-based applied research. So what's the problem you're trying to solve and what are the incentives to get people uh, involved? <clears throat> One of the big challenges that the social science has been dealing with <clears throat> is even conflicts of interest making sure that those are managed transparently and that they're not um, creating the wrong incentives for research. Uh, and you're seeing even, you know, whether the scandals are real or not, there's a lot of concern about all these stories that keep bubbling up about we didn't realize this research might have had a different incentive set than we thought. So I think that is not to be um, understated. And medical science has actually dealt with that in a very good way in the past generation to have a whole set of protocols to think more clearly about what they care about. And different countries have different institutions for dealing with it. And I think that the, the big thing is, if you want to get uh, researchers to collaborate, give them a problem that they might actually be able to help solve. It's typically a very strong incentive. Rather than tell them, ask them to come up with a new theory on some problem that might not exist, where they'll be very busy, but they might not actually have the same incentive system. But if I may, I'd just like to come back to the previous points uh, quickly, because this notion of uh, concentration of many things at once is, a, is related to what we would call even the growth side of inclusive growth. And one of the big challenges right now is very fundamental, just speaking as economists, where you know, growth ultimately in the long run is driven by productivity gains. One of the big problems right now in many of the advanced economies is that the productivity gains are very concentrated among very large firms. And we, we see this in the tech industry, for example, which is doing tremendous things to drive down, for example, the potential costs of social protection through very low co transaction cost connectivity. But the drivers of that have ultimately network effects that are uh, you know, at risk of being natural monopolies with huge powers, and even that word is controversial in some places. But uh, they're natural, they're not necessarily intended. And grappling with uh, the role of the productivity puzzle as a driver of you know, wealth concentration and opportunity concentration in an economy, in, as economies become more and more um, gig-oriented, less employment-oriented, provides a whole new set of puzzles for how you think about social policy and how you even invest in skills and how you invest in what it means to have a city where people's jobs, jobs might be uh, on their laptop at home. And so all these questions are highly interconnected. And I would say, you know, the, the po most positive side, I did a calculation recently of you know, extreme poverty there's about 650 million people in the world living in extreme poverty, the kind of dollar a day type poverty. Roughly 185 million of those people live in countries where the government alone, the home government, could end extreme poverty through cash transfers for less than 1% of GNP. You know, that's a huge, that's because of technology bringing the cost down so much. The flip side is if you're an advanced economy, you want to interact with the technology, you need the skills, 
and I would argue it's one of the great puzzles in the world today why we're not investing in skills. Exactly. We have Malala <laughs> winning the Nobel Peace Prize. You couldn't have a more heroic, articulate, bold champion uh, for education. We have Gordon Brown <laughs> raising attention after attention. We have Julia Gillard <laughs> raising uh, you know, the issue after the issue. In the past generation, we've seen a breakthrough, a tremendous breakthrough in investments in health. Well, why haven't we seen the investments in skills? In really in any part of the world, let alone to match the problems that are coming in front of us. And I think we really have to confront this. There are some countries that are doing better and better at taking this on, but I would argue this is probably the lowest hanging fruit in the world policy-wise is to invest in literacy, numeracy, breadth of skills. We don't even have the metrics to agree on so far, but it's even Julia Gillard makes this point. We need just agree on the metrics, please, so that we can know what we're financing. But in front of that, if we want to have a hope of taking on the technology economy, that needs to be the baseline. Yeah. And if Larry Summers made this argument a generation ago, investing in girl is the highest return dollar in development, why is it still such a teeny, teeny share? of all yes. our investments. And this is a deep paradox. I think we have to be aware of, uh, we're not living our truth on that one yet. Right, Minister Alzate. Okay, um, very interesting topics. I would like to comment on the, on the question about uh, how to improve the connection between research and, and enterprises with an answer that you're not gonna probably like. Because uh, as you said, Colombia and every country has its particularities. In Colombia, the problem is not about connecting research with enterprises. The problem is moving enterprises to the frontier of technology. It is estimated about 80% about of the gains in productivity are gonna be uh, through just moving frontier, to the frontier to the, of the technology of the enterprises. So we're working with the World Bank in a managerial services, sur a survey about practices in managing. And uh, the results were very, very bad for Colombia. So we have, we have the, the worst practices in terms of managerial practices in Latin America, uh, well below our level of development. But the most important problem is that people don't tend to know that they are bad at managing their, their enterprises. So if you don't know that you're bad at something, you're not gonna do anything about it. So there's an informational problem that we're trying to tackle and we're doing some technology service with uh, uh, manufacturing and service medium enterprises and small enterprises to improve on managerial practices that we think currently is the bottleneck for productivity growth in Colombia. So, of course, we're also working in terms of connecting universities and, and enterprises, but the focus right now is improving managerial practices. Now, I'd like to comment on some of the topics that have been raised uh, before. Uh, Again, Colombia has some particularities. For example, uh, more than 50% of jobs are informal jobs. You mentioned the problem of, of informality. But sometimes informality is the market reaction to regulation. Uh, and I just want to make, make uh, one case in point. The minimum wage in Colombia is one of the highest relative to the median wage, to the average wage, in the region. So Colombia has one of the largest minimum wages relative to the average or median wage. And when you take a look at informality rates across the country, across the different cities in Colombia, well, not surprisingly, those, those cities where the average income is higher have the lower informality rates. And I'm talking about differences that are in Bogota, informality rates about 17%. In cities uh, in the coast, which are backward and poor, informality goes to 80%. So we also have to take care that uh, the the, the informality sometimes is just the market response to excessive regulation that doesn't take into account that productivity growth is not high uh, across the whole nation. Mm. You mentioned again the problem of having, we call it the democratization of productivity. It's important that Bogota, Medellin, but also the small cities have high productivity growth. So uh, we think that uh, we, along with the formality agenda, we also have to have an agenda that uh, gets people towards the entrepreneurial mood. So it's not only about firms versus labor and high wages and minimum wages, it's also about setting up the conditions that uh, can uh, unlock the entrepreneurial spirit 
for every citizen in the Colombian economy. So it's, it's also important to move toward that agenda. It's not only about wages and the firms, it's also about how do we, we, do, do we, do we increase uh, productivity growth through entrepreneurial activities. Right. Can I, can I just take, I think, lots of wisdom there, but I just want to challenge the productivity argument. I've been having a look at the figures, actually, for what drives economies, and I think US is more than 70% consumption-based. Now, productivity is always nice where you can drive productivity and we can bargain collectively and share in it as a dollar piece that pumps up consumption, obviously, or savings, take your pick. But indeed, we live with this myth that somehow you can get productivity from somewhere if it's not actually been driven off pretty fundamental 101 growth, which is supply and demand through consumption. So I, I actually think we have to have a, have a look at that. And I think nobody's really doing the figures on what it would, uh, what the, the growth impact would be on resource productivity. And we have to really take that on because I think that is the new wealth. I say to labour leaders, you know, get in there, help reduce emissions, let's get the zero economy on, uh, zero carbon economy on track because it saves money and we can bargain for it in wealth, which again drives up people's capacity. So I just think we have to look at a balance of those old thinking uh, areas around productivity. Well, just, but the, no, go ahead. Oh, just, just to clarify, there's one kind of mathematical truth, which is if you create something new, that's a productivity boost and that's a new innovation. But the whole, that's not inconsistent with it all. What I was saying at the outset was just the decoupling problem. And so yep. part of what I think we ultimately need to get to, and the commission, which I was also an advisor to, came um, up with is this need for benchmarking. And companies, and it's a big issue for the next five to 10 years, to get really common standards for each industry on what's the company measuring itself against. Because if we, it's not just your 10K if you're a US company or your shareholder price, it's all the other things that matter in your supply chain and your energy efficiency and your footprint of, and your products and what uh, broader societal problems are you actually helping to solve or at a minimum not make worse. Yeah. And we actually don't have ways for companies in a strong way to compare themselves yet and that they need that. One of the things, though, is the gig economy. I really wanted to take this up because it kind of drives me crazy. You know, these are just... these. I, I've been talking to a lot of people uh, who are in various sectors driving businesses on a digital platform. They're platform business. Not a, it's not a platform economy. They're platform businesses. The difference is they have no licence, no social licence to operate as businesses. And until governments, and some are now, impose a social licence to operate, and what does it mean to be a registered business? That means you have to pay your tax where you earn it, means you have to take some responsibility for whatever the system is of paying into social protection for your employees. It's not true that Uber doesn't have dependent employees. They do. It's not about the technology. Any business that doesn't adapt technology that people want will fail. But it is about business leaders who are simply absolving responsibility and saying, I'm going to take all of the profits from your labour, but it doesn't matter, government, whether I'm using your roads or your communication service infrastructure, I'm not going to pay you any tax and I'm not going to contribute to the welfare of the people making me the profit. An end. If we just, sorry, but regulate, properly regulate for a social licence to operate, it's also not fair on other businesses. Any other business has to actually, you know, accommodate the social licence. They can't get away with tax evasion. They can't get away with, you know, unsafe conditions for people without having to go to court and defend themselves. So governments have to step up and actually say every business, every business, doesn't matter what the shape or form is, has a licence to operate. We can organise the workers. That's not the problem, provided we can see freedom of association respected. The problem is, if you're just letting people in the rule of the jungle take profit without any responsibility, and that's not what societies have ever been about or should be about. That's why the recoupling is critical. But I would just add, and then uh, the as I spoke about disruptive technologies, and I would, uh, with all due respect, I would want Ms. Mamboro to think about it that I'll just give you one example, and I can give you hundreds. WhatsApp, Facebook, they all operate from the United States. 
and they do not have their offices in every part of the world. Yet, they do business in other countries yep. and don't pay any tax yep. and don't engage any labor. Yet, they do business and get away with it. I will hold from here onwards for you to think, what would you say on that? I'm on your team. <laughs> pay your tax where you earn it. That's what BEPS is about. That's what the G20 is yes. engaged in. So if you're earning money in that country, it's traceable. And if it's not, there's a very old fashioned uh, yeah. uh, piece that uh, the European government's kind of dodged in the end, which is, of course, the uh, financial transaction tax. So that's what Again, I'm saying. Yeah. Where you earn it. That's what I'm saying. That in this world of disruptive technologies, the way things are moving, you will not have the traditional ways and means of having physical labor, physical presence, physical companies. You will have remote accesses, remote businesses, remote companies. And that's why we need to have this new social contract to talk about the future, how it is evolving. And we need to talk about everything all in one go. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Minister Alzate, and then I think we should... Yeah, I just want to comment on one of the of the questions that uh, asked about uh, the importance of cities. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't want to pass up on, the, on, that, on that question. So, um, so every, every country, again, uh, it's uh, tied to its own dynamic. Colombia is a very urban economy. More than 70% of the people live in cities. We have large cities around the country. Uh, but one of the things we're working on is land use planning. Uh, we have uh, at least 30% of the land properties that is outdated. Around 80% of the municipalities have updated lands and, and use plans. So we're implementing what we call a multi-purpose cadaster, which is essentially planning with up-to-date information with one important component, which is adaptation and mitigation of ch climate change, which has been disregarded for the plans that were constructed eight or 12 years ago. So I mentioned this, well, that sounds like a very, uh, an, uh, an important issue for developing economies, but for example, in Houston, I just read, uh, the, the past month, that Houston is the largest city in the U.S. that doesn't have any land zone regulations. And uh, that's, well, when you think about things that affect uh, 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 the, the environment, uh, well, the flooding effect, for example, well, you think about the importance of regulating some part of land zone use. And uh, we're working towards that, especially in Colombia, which is a growing economy and is going to be having growing uh, cities as well. The importance of having these components in, in terms of mitigation to climate change it, towards uh, the long term. So. Right. Thank you. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion. I mean, I take away two or three points of cheer and at least one point of well, not despair, but gloom or challenge. Um, you know, the good news is that the issue of inclusion or inequality is absolutely center stage on the agenda. We all agree about that. Um, the even better news is that there are tangible examples and granular steps, policy steps being taken to try and think about this. And we've heard a number of them um, on the platform today about not simply ways that we could move, but ways that people are trying to act and move already. Um, the bad news is that there are still formidable obstacles, and I think as Sharon says very clearly, and has been picked up by the panel, you know, what to do about technology remains in some ways one of the most challenging issues. It crystallized a lot of the questions about inequality and inclusion. Um, I was chatting to someone yesterday who said, well, in some ways what's happening with technology today is a bit like oil or commodity, in that oil has been used to create some relatively equal, integrated, inclusive societies like Norway that in some ways are a shining success story about inclusion and economic growth. Oil has also been used to create some terrible oligarchs and the riches of oil have been used to essentially prop up the wealthy at the expense of the poor. Either way, what you have essentially is a massive windfall gain suddenly that gives an economy a shock. And the question is how that windfall gain is used. And it seems to me that technology is very similar. It could be used to create much more inclusive societies where even girls in remote villages in Pakistan are given for the first time in their lives a chance to actually participate and have economic power. Yeah. And having lived with them for a long time, that is so transformational. All technology can be used to create these essential monopolies where power is concentrated in the hands of few who never actually pay taxes anywhere. That's a question about which way we're going to go. 
So on that note, I'm going to hand over now to um, Jan Walliser, who's going to leave us with a few thoughts to wrap up with um, and try to summarize some of this debate. Jan. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here, although I, I feel that uh, having been two hours on the train from in Wilmington uh, waiting on the way up, uh, that the first point of inclusive growth would be infrastructure, 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 <laughs> um, before we go to anything else. But um, uh, that aside, um, having listened to some of you uh, coming in, I think I'm particularly happy to hear both the combination, of course, of education, but also a uh, uh, minister from uh, Colombia who mentioned the, the work that we're doing on firm capabilities which is one of the key issues that we find is critical for raising productivity at the firm level, is something that we, that, that we feel strongly um, has been overlooked at uh, working actually directly with firms and making them stronger and uh, raise their productivity as, we, um, as they uh, bring more work on and they have to hire, and hire more labor uh, over time and then can integrate into global value chains more easily. So that brings me to the point that I wanted to make. Um, uh, originally at the outset uh, of, this, of this conversation um, about when we think about inclusive growth, I think one of the um, paradigm shifts that we're seeing is that originally we, had, we have had this mantra to just talk about let's do structural reforms um, and the private sector will, do, uh, will, will deal with the rest. Um, and often that resulted in more fiscal adjustment and, and, and difficulties at the country level, but not necessarily in a comprehensive thinking of what was necessary. And I think you all are aware that uh, as we track inequality around the world, we've seen rising inequality around the world, and even though there has been a slowing down of this trend uh, since the global financial crisis, uh, with some countries turning the corner a little bit, we still have uh, two-thirds of countries having significantly higher inequality today than they had uh, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So I think from, from that perspective and bringing these pieces together, uh, what has been important, of course, has been the highlight on, on skills, the in inclusion and the ability of people to continue uh, participating in the global economy by investing in education and skill levels, um, has been the, I mentioned infrastructure, but has also been what we find is increasing, increasingly important is exactly understanding the microeconomics of the, of the growth process, the microeconomics at the firm level, and the linkages between the financial sector, financial access, skills, and uh, firm capabilities that are so critical to bring uh, eco firms and economies to the frontier. And I think this is something that uh, links very closely with the work that we've been doing with the World Economic Forum on global value chains and sustainable value chains, to start finding a way in which uh, firms around the world can actually access information about what is it that, uh, where are people investing, where are firms investing in value chains, where are they engaging, where are they expanding, and what are the opportunities for local firms to tap into these value chains, and what are the practices and the regulatory environment that is needed to make the participation in these value chains sustainable. And that's a, a platform, the, the Grow Inclusive platform that you ha may have, been, have heard mentioned before that uh, we're working on, that we've been working on for some time now and that will be launched uh, in January uh, and, and go public. It's uh, going to uh, provide, it's going to use big data for uh, allowing us uh, around the world to see actually what is happening in the, in the value chain world, but also uh, give the public side sufficient information on regulating or overseeing the expansion of these value chains in the way that they're actually sustainable and that workers who are tapping into these value chains have jobs that are safe and, uh, and sound and secure and uh, um, not damaging the environment either. So I think that's the, that's the vision. It's going from the big reforms and the big structural reforms to the more micro understanding of uh, what's happening at the firm level and supporting the integration of uh, the de developing world into these value chains to then get lasting reduction of poverty uh, around the world as, as more workers actually tap and are able to be part of uh, trade and development um, and the growth process um, going forward. Thank you very much. Great, well th thank you.